this is the Pizza Palace, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> it's like episode who gives a fuck. And, I'm just uh, like, I just turn it on. And your first instinct is just to go <laughs> just right into the microphone. That's correct. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm getting rid of all the casuals, you know, as quickly as possible. Just all the normies, the losers, the, you know, just, tr- just trying to weed them out a little bit, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, thanks for your click anyways, but, you know, fuck off. Yeah. If thanks uh, for watching that advertisement and giving us that sweet, sweet cash revenue. Exactly. <laughs> like, we got what we needed, so, like, we don't need you anymore. No, um, <laughs> but how's it going, my friend? Oh, dude, it's going good. It's I'm going sure you're good. very pleased with the uh, the Michigan Wolverines defeating the Ohio Buckeyes. Was that game? Did, did that? Uh... Oh, yeah. No, dude, of course. Yeah. So I the last time Michigan beat Ohio State at in home. Columbus or well, yeah, at Columbus. Yeah, yeah. In Columbus in the fucking horseshoe was 2000. I was, was mm-hmm, it was 2000. I was three years old. Nice. So I have never been conscious mm. and, and, and been able to wrap around my head and, and see for myself, Michigan beat Ohio state in, in Ohio. their own stadium. So mm. for me, it was like last year, it was an awesome game. I was, you know, even though that team was insanely talented, I had my serious doubts if they could actually you know, beat Ohio state, even in their own stadium. And sure. I was pleasantly surprised with how that game turned out. And then, you know, the whole Harbaugh snafu happened this off season, the, you know, am I, am I staying? Am I leaving? You know, like, Oh, he's the Vikings favorite until you find out. No, they just kind of brought him in for like a formal like interview. And then he comes back and does the whole Michael Scott, this is my home. This is where I'll always be. You know, he and really did Michael Scott the fuck out of that whole yeah, situation. Yeah, didn't 100%. He? yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So and the Vikings have been seemingly doing pretty goddamn well without him. So. Well, and, and, but here's the thing. Michigan's been doing pretty damn well with him. And the thing that's been surprising, you know, like the, so the thing that you, you know, for years is that Jim Harbaugh frustrated the living hell out of me because yes, for years, he was an amazing coach at Stanford. Mm. It, it, you know, he, he ran, a, you know, he ran a stellar program that won a lot of games that had Andrew luck, you know, that ran the ball down your throat. And sure. then, you know, you go to the 49ers. He literally takes a program that was, you know, inept for years. And then in his second season gets them to the Super Bowl. you know, and then comes to Michigan and, it seems like, you know, when he came to Michigan, he got super nostalgic. He thought of Bo Beckler and his, you know, and his childhood and all this stuff. And, and it was weird because for a few, for like his first few years at Michigan, it's like he was running, he was trying to run a lot of like the classic formations and things that Bo Schembechler, Bo Schembechler's team would run. The problem is that was 50 years ago. This is 2020. Like this is the this is the twenty teens, twenty twenties, right? You have to run a modern offense. Not only that, why aren't you just doing what worked at Stanford? Why aren't you just doing what worked at with the 49ers? You know what I mean? And like that's finally what he's been doing over the last couple of years. He's finally gotten back to his roots, but also he finally has a quarterback who's dynamic, who can take over a game, who can change a game. Because JJ McCarthy, like the first half, we couldn't run the ball at all. We only had no. we only had twelve rushing yards. The first half, it's first half didn't look overly good, to be honest. You know what's interesting, by the way? Mm-hmm. Michigan in the first half had twelve rushing yards. Right. Uh, Ohio State had like over two hundred and twenty. Yep. Michi- I watched the first half of that game at a beat ups, by the way. <laughs> and then I watched it at a Dave and Buster's. And then <laughs> and then uh, and then the and then the second half. Uh, and then in the second half, Michigan ran for over 280 yards, and Ohio State ran for eight. So it literally just flipped. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Michigan's in the second half. Uh, Michigan's offensive line just completely controlled the tempo of the game. But ultimately, like what what made the difference was that 
you know, in that first half when Ohio State was stopping the run, what they were doing was they were they were uh, they were stacking the box. They were playing one safety high, and then they were pl- they were putting you know two corners man to man on their on Michigan's wide receivers, you know, out, out on the edge. And they were essentially saying, "We're going to stop the run, and we bet that you can't beat us over the top." Like they were daring Michigan to to throw it deep, right? And JJ McCarthy threw it deep, and the kid can be a little reckless at times. He, you know, he he can't. He's not always, you know, he doesn't always play the best game. That was his best performance as as a Michigan quarterback by far. Every decision he made was the right one, and in addition, he just was, you know, he was dynamic with his feet. He was precise with his, you know, with his arm. There were some throws that were a little wacky, but once he got it, got the ball to where he needed to, there were some throws that were on a dime. That kid is just special. So, you know, seeing the prospect of if he comes back another year and, you know, just the fact that, you know, we didn't even have Blake Corum, who's the Heisman candidate running back, Donovan Edwards, what he did in that second half, specifically that fourth quarter. That was, you know, one of like, I've seen Michigan get their asses kicked over the years by Ohio State. I've seen this rivalry, like, I've seen some dominant performances in this rivalry. Right. I've never seen a thorough ass kicking like that. Like, just to that, like, Ohio State couldn't do anything. Yeah. I've never seen that, especially from them. It was, it, it was jarring. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and honestly, the um, college football this season has been really odd in general, just because like this has been one of the more exciting seasons in a lot of ways, because um, there was there hasn't been like a clear cut uh, favorite, really. Um, and really, a like lot of the, these really <clears throat> outside of Georgia, like really. Right. Like exactly. Only... Yeah. But yeah, it's just been kind of interesting because like there's been a lot of movement in the top four, you know, a lot of comers and goers and some teams like Tennessee having these brilliant runs and then yeah, a lot, a lot of comers. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so I have like such a NASCAR brain. That's like a NASCAR term and it doesn't make sense to anybody who doesn't watch the sport. It's it's fine. It's OK. I, it's just one of those things where like out of context when you're uh-huh. just like. We were talking about, yeah, college football. There's a lot of comers, a lot of goers. Just like, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's okay. NASCAR fans know what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> All 12 of you out there, you know exactly what Robert's talking about. That's right. You know what I'm putting down. Anyways, uh, NASCAR Nation, let's ride. <laughs> let's fucking ride, guys. Let's come and go. Uh, but so, <laughs> so, anyways. No, but like, you know, you've had teams falling in and out, you know, like you Tennessee obviously was like a big story for a little bit. Now all of mm-hmm. a sudden TCU's in the conversation. Unfortunately, USC is in the conversation after beating Notre Dame. <laughs> and uh yeah, of all the fucking teams I hate. God damn it. I hate USC with such a passion. Be, so be yeah. Pre- by the way, just be prepared for them to take over college football in five years. I'd like I within five years i should say yeah i'd like that to just not happen sean uh but what it's gonna happen man. i will say i am looking forward to watching uh michigan lose to georgia in the national championship that will be very <laughs> fun for me I listen like man, that. listen just but... if, if michigan were to get there at all sure that would be a massive victory for the program and sure. you know like here, here's what i will say like jim harbaugh was doubted by a lot of people a lot of people were calling for his job. Yeah. He, he, he took an extension that was a pay cut. And, you know, he he essentially made a lot of adjustments and, and did a lot of things to turn that organization around, you know, both on the offensive end and on the defensive end. Like, they changed a lot of personnel and staff and coordinators. Jim Harbaugh, you know, went back and worked with his brother, John, and, you know, like, you know, helped, you know, like, figure out, like, who would be a good coordinator you know, for the defense for Michigan and what they sure. need to do to get back to their roots, which by the way, the fact that they, you know, the fact that, you know, Michigan, you know, coming into this season, the big question mark was their defense, you know, without, you know, with, without Aiden Hutchinson and David yeah. Njabo, what can this defense do? That defense is special. And, you know, it, it's just like, this is like what Michigan football 
is supposed to look like from like the expectation standpoint of like this is like the like what Michigan fans build build up Michigan football to be. Mm. That's what it looked like. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, like for what, sure. That's like at like at its apex. That's the best representation of Michigan football. Now, am I saying we're the greatest program in the country? No. Obviously, this is like you know just two years in a row out of how many years did we you know just get our asses kicked? But it's interesting now, right? Like it's sure. it's it's a rivalry again for sure. And you know now going into that going into that you know contest every year. You know, it's interesting to see, especially like with Jim Harbaugh, like how much Mi- Michigan held, you know, in their playbook and, you know, like just for this game. Yeah. Like insane. Yeah, for sure. Like you could tell that like this, this was obviously the be all end all game that they've been prepared for. Oh, yeah. And and I'm not going to lie, dude. It was. I just was wish the re- games like this weren't at noon. Yeah, I get You know what it. I mean? Like it really fucks with me. Like I'm so used to professional sports to where it's like the important games are at night. So for it to be at noon where yeah. it's like by three o'clock, it's like, oh yeah, you know, to for people to be like partying or whatever. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, it's so like they, odd. They've played it in the evening before. I like I think traditionally it's mostly just been played at noon. And to be honest with you, like, you know, I I, I love the feeling of waking up at noon and like having that atmosphere of like of everyone tailgating college football game day leading right into the game. Like it was, it was electric, man. And like, I I'm think I'm just lie. used to Notre Dame. Like a lot of our games are prime time. So I think that's probably right. what it is to be honest that's, with you. No, that's totally fair. That's totally yeah. valid. And which we me, were prime time and we got fucking smoked by USC. Well, it's it. Well, you know, what's interesting. <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting. Michigan. Do you remember uh, Michigan Notre Dame under the lights at the big yes. house? Yes. Uh, that was Michigan's first ever night game at the big house so yep, for, they traditionally for like, do not do that yeah so so you, you you know like whereas notre dame traditionally they play a lot of their games in prime time michigan Always, traditionally yeah. plays a lot of games a lot of their games at noon so anyway uh it was really satisfying to see michigan win it you know in general last year it was sure. really cool to see it you know see them win it at, you know at their at their home see their fans be happy you know like a celebration sure to see all of those mo- those mother Ohio State fans. If I could bottle up those tears and buy a two liter and drink them on the pod, I would chug that right now because it was, oh, it was satisfying. It, like, and especially planting your flag in the logo. So, like, if I could, if I could articulate how, like, just properly, just how I feel about this game and, and about this team, it, this is, this is where I'm at. I'm all about sportsmanship and for celebrating the, the I tweeted this after the, after the game. I'm all oh about boy. sportsmanship and for celebrating the unity of sports. But if I could piss on OSU's field right now, I'd take the first chance. Luckily, my team pissed on them for me. Classy. I listen, dude. Typical I, Michigan fan. I listen, I will be classy with any other team in sports. Except uh-huh. the Patriots and anything Tom Brady related, but when it comes to Ohio State, uh huh, ligma. That's kind of you. You sound a lot like me when talking about either the New Orleans Saints or the Houston Astros. Like this is pretty much the level of like vitriol I have for those two programs. I, so like, ro- like I'm 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 of the way like even like a Pistons playoff game. Sure. Like I get into it. Like I get intense. Obviously it means a lot to me. Well, you basically never seen one. So. So anyway, well, normally whenever I see like a game that like, you know, like generally in sports, like even if it's like a big game, I'll watch it. And like, you know, I'm into it, but like at the end of the day, it's fun. I'm having fun. Right. Yeah. When I'm watching, I when I'm watching the Michigan, Ohio state game, that's yeah. my mom. Anyway, hey, uh, man. <laughs> we'll explain that in a minute. I'm but so anyway, I'm on the pod. We'll explain that in a minute. We don't but, need to continue. Yeah, one hundred percent. But that made me completely lose my train of thought. I oh yeah, when you, I watch Michigan oh. Ohio State, when I watch Michigan Ohio State, I am not having fun. I am sitting there like I'm just sitting there like this, just like. And I'm like, 
And like whenever something like good happens, I'm like, let's go. Good shit. Good shit. <laughs> Believe me, I've I've been on the couch when you were watching Michigan, Michigan State, and I was having the time of my life as Michigan State absolutely stomped a mud hole through the stupid fucking Wolverines. It was awesome. The satisfaction. Yeah, so anyway. And, and watching you just be sad on the couch with that very hat on. I think it was one of Harbaugh's like first years or something like that, and you were just sad. Just sad. Just sad. And it was very, very, uh, it was very nice. I liked to see that. That was enjoyable. Uh, you know. <laughs> I think the way that the... you feel about Ohio State fans is about how I feel about Michigan fans. I'm just like, fuck those pieces of shit. And listen, and listen, I... And in, in, in you and I have had plenty of conversations. You know my opinion of, of Michigan fans. I think I think for a lot of years, you know, they've been very, you know, we've been a very ent entitled fan base that, you know, that is believed that we have believed to be something that we're not. And you know me over the last few uh -huh. years, I have I have I have been a truth teller of Michigan football. I have said when this program has been dog shit. Sure. Right. But to Jim Harbaugh's credit. As of right now, he controls the Big Ten. It runs through him. It's true. So, and uh, yeah, man. I, I, and and listen, I, I will. Here, here's here's what I'll say. Mm. I firmly believe that Mich. I, I don't think Michigan's going to win the national championship. I don't think it's going to happen. But if it were to happen, mm. this would be the year. Because it definitely feels that way. Like it feels like of all the like programs, this seems like one of their best that they've had in a long time. Well, not only that, but also like the top, like 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 we just said, like there's more parity in college football this year than yeah. there's been in a while. Like really outside yes. of Georgia, like TCU, I'm not sure what to expect from them if they were to match up with with Michigan. I'm not sure if TCU could handle the physicality of sure. of, of Michigan's line, right? Mm. Um, and then like USC, their their offense is great. Caleb Williams sure. is great. What what's... he's annoying, but yeah, yeah. I mean, they all, all the a lot of these young listen, dude. A lot of I'm these so young... fucking bitter, dude. <laughs> I'm such a bitter little shit. My program's in the fucking dumps. Okay, so... but like okay, but be honest with me, Robert. If the Tampa uh, Bay Buccaneers were to tank next year and sure. just absolutely suck mm. and be in the position to draft him and you were, and he became a Buccaneers quarterback. Yeah, yeah. Look me in the eyes and tell me you wouldn't be supporting him. And you wouldn't buy a Jersey. He is going to need to look uh... me in the eyes. Well, here's the problem. Uh, the, the one issue I have with him is that my case. in college, he, he tries to pretend that he's Patrick Mahomes, like junior, but like, is that going to translate to the NFL? I don't know. You know, or is he going to be prancing around the field like a little dildo and then get crushed? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, so and also right now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, offensive line has not been looking exactly the best. Yeah, and I, unless I, they get healthy or start drafting some replacements in the next year or so. I, I would say, like, I think you can generally tell with quarterbacks when they're doing it to be cute and when they're mm. doing it to actually, like, extend a play sure. and actually trying to do it to, like, for the sake of the game. Like, I feel like guys like uh, like Johnny Manziel. And guys like uh, Zach Wilson are the types of guys that try to make a play and go out and do it for the sake of like, you know, trying to make it look cute. But I feel like sure. guys, I feel like, I feel like Patrick Mahomes, like he's out there extending a play. Like he's, he's a backyard football type quarterback where he's processing everything in real time. Right. You know? Right. And, and, and like, and you know, so I, I feel like there's like those certain quarterbacks you know, like, like another quarterback. I just don't know that he's that is that that's all I'm saying. Yeah, like no, Patrick Mahomes fair. is obviously who he is, but like it's one of those until you get to the NFL, it's impossible to know if you're gonna translate or not. It just is. Right. So yeah, sure. I, honestly, that would be my biggest concern is like I think that his ceiling could be extremely high, but I think that his floor could come immediate. Like well, he could he would be like an instant bust. If, well, and also you know, how how much have we seen in the NFL this year too, just mm. how important it is to be drafted by the right team, to be drafted right. to the right system. Like, like we were talking about Tua Tonga Vailoa last year, and saying that his career, like he, we were talking about him, like he was a bust. 
And he literally, he literally said that he thought he sucked. Yeah. And, and, you know, to his credit, the new head coach of the Miami Dolphins, I believe, isn't it, is, is it Mike McDaniels? I got to be honest with you. I'm not entirely sure who the coaching staff is on that team, but I will say this, that like, I've believed in Tua since he got drafted. And to be honest, like, yeah, Mike McDaniel. Okay. So like it very quickly became like this talking point, like almost immediately that he was like a bust and that he was no good and this and that. And like the talks just kept getting worse and worse. People kept talking about like, they got to trade for a quarterback, got to trade for a quarterback, blah, blah, blah. Like it was like, it went from tank for Tua to suddenly like, oh, Tua is the biggest bust of all time or some bullshit. Like it was really weird how the narrative changed. And at least for me personally, like, yeah, they weren't out there having like the greatest success ever or whatever, but like, I I just maybe I was foolish, but I believed him. I was like, no, just give him some time. Like he's a young quarterback. He's trying to learn a system where he's got like, you know, clearly the management's got some issues and the head coaching has not been consistent. They don't really have a lot of weapons and stuff like that. Like they were kind of they were a little bit wishy washy with the program. And now he's had some stability and it's going great. And they also got him one of the best targets in football. You know, so it's like it, it, to be honest, I was just like literally I don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about, but if you guys want to be dumb and pull the trigger on trading him, send him to Tampa or the Raiders, because I can tell you this much, like y'all are going to be really fucking sorry you did that. So, um, yeah, I, I believed in him, but it was one of those kind of, I'm now I'm going full LeBron James. Listen, man, I saw this coming, man. I said to my friends, <laughs> I said to my friends, this kid next year. No, but like, but really, though, like, I don't know, maybe I'm just ignorant a lot of times because, you know, I it's not like I have the NFL league pass or whatever the fuck they call it nowadays to Sunday ticket, whatever the fuck. So, like, I, I don't watch his games regularly, but I just kind of assumed I was just like, no, he's, he's a young quarterback. Give him some time. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. it's it's one of those things where like two where like a lot of his coaching staff last year, like like half of the coaching staff, like pretty much didn't believe in Tua. Right. right. And like and like the. And like a lot of the things worked on that team. Like they, they had a great defense. They had like every, it seemed like they had everything. Sure. But it wasn't coming together at the quarterback. And, sure. um, you know, like, so there was, so during this uh, Texans game this past week, um, there was a sideline report where they were talking about how Tua came in and like, they were talking to the team, like to the people that were covering the game like a day before. And um, essentially he just said to um, like he he admitted that he was looking himself in the mirror and literally saying, do I suck? Like, because like he was hearing the discourse, he like it was because of his play, like he was struggling. And like because like a lot of his coaching staff didn't even have like be- like feel like he didn't have belief in him. And Mike McDaniel came in and he created a 700. He, he compiled 700 plays of Tua Tungavailoa all throughout his career to show him why he doesn't suck. And as a matter of fact, how he's freaking awesome. And guy, like he's dude. just in, in, he so like he just instilled the confidence in him, but also he's empowering him by putting a system that fits what he's good at and utilizes his skills. Like a lot of times, like coaches are like, oh, this guy sucks. And they're like, oh, well, it's clearly because he sucks. But like even what we just saw with Justin Fields this year, too, at the beginning of the year, it was like, oh, this guy is a terrible passer. He can't play quarterback. Sure. And then as it turns out, if you let a guy who can run, not just stand in the pocket, but run, it can add a dynamic to your football team. Who would have thought? But also with Tua, it's like if you let a guy who's accurate have really fast wide receivers who can run great routes and he can throw it in a dime. Sure. It's a great system, man. And and he's a funny dude, too, by the way. Well, and the thing that's so strange to me, man, is I just don't understand how some quarterbacks, it's like the instant like, oh, God, they're a bust. They suck like this kind of like narrative just hits a quarterback immediately. But then we give guys like Trevor Lawrence seemingly a pass. Like, I haven't heard a ton of rhetoric about him. Like, I don't hear like he's a fucking dog shit quarterback who, you know, and this, that, whatever. I'm like, mostly because probably no one gives a shit about the Jaguars. But like, but also like he. Yeah, I will I mean, say he had a pretty good game against Baltimore this past Sunday. 
I, well, that's my thing is like he's not bad and I'm not trying to trash Trevor Lawrence. I think right, he's a good course. quarterback as well. But if you look at his success up to this point in the NFL and you look at Tua's success or whatever, I mean, it's not super incomparable. Like both quarterbacks kind of had a shit start to their careers. So it's like, I mean, why did one guy get raked over the coals and needed to be traded to every team in, you know, the NFL? But Trevor Lawrence, it's like, oh, well, just give him time. Just give him time. You know, and all this kind of it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, how, yeah. come he, how come he gets time? But Tua needs to be traded or Justin Fields needs to be traded. Like, what the fuck are we doing yeah. here? Well, it's yeah. like a lot of times, too. Like, I, I think like people just overreact like and Tua. Like, yeah, he doesn't have a Josh Allen type arm. Right. But well, again, right. But again, like as long as you can get the ball to your receiver, which, you know, his accuracy, man, I mean, bloody hell. Like he like I feel like so much of that shit gets overblown so quickly, by the way, like everyone and their mother loves to be the armchair reporter on Twitter who's like, you know, every quarterback who is coming into the NFL suddenly has like this weak arm. They can't throw it more than 10 yards. I'm just like, dude. You're a rookie quarterback. You're being traded or, or sorry, you're getting drafted by a shit team. Most likely who probably doesn't have a good offensive line. Like there's a reason why that a quarterback goes high in the draft It's because they're on a right. team. That's awful. So right. like when that quarterback goes to the jets or the dolphins or the Jaguars or the bears, like, well, the unless Lions, you're Mike white, if you're Mike white, you can go off and you can, you can be a, a baller for the jets for sure but, but like yeah it's just like these guys enter the league and then they're not instant superstars and everyone just like oh my god he sucks and this and that like he's not ready for the league it's like the fuck are you talking about dude dude so i got i gotta share this funny clip so um there was a game where uh mike mcdaniel was yelling at justin fields to stop uh when uh when he was running on the field and uh they asked him why he did it during a press oh conference. yeah i saw that yeah so I just wanted him to stop scrambling and it was pretty irritating because he didn't listen at all. <laughs> at that stage of the game, he was <laughs> just like he didn't take the coaching. Like I love going because he didn't love stop. This. Like he's so just nice. dude. He's such a funny dude. Like I yeah. just and, and like he just seems super chill. I've just been like watching like a lot of interviews and just clips from him. But like he even like there was even this uh, there was even this uh, uh, mic'd up moment where uh, Mike McDaniel was talking to Tua on the sideline during a game. And it's just like, the, he he just seems like a guy you want to play with because he has that mix of, of like that, you know, that brilliant, like schematic, you know, like, you know, being able to like, you know, like that brilliant, like offensive mind, but also like being a human being. Because like how many coaches are just, just seem like a freaking, like, like a whiteboard personality yeah. wise, you know? It, it feels like it's very rare when the two come together where you're both a rah rah guy and also a guy who clearly understands football. Yeah, 100%. I woke up like at three and I couldn't go back to sleep. So I, were, I was thinking about when you randomly hit me up that you're YouTubing me. Yeah. And so then I YouTubed you and heard and saw this Trent Dilfer thing <laughs> showing all this high school from you. Trent. And bro, your, your technique was trash. <laughs> You know what I mean? Thank yeah. God for Bev. What are you talking about? No, no rhythm, no timing? Is that what you're talking about? It was cool though, because you could see little elements of like your swag. Um, but you were, yeah, you were stressed out. Woo! <laughs> Dude, he just seems like a cool guy, you know? And yeah, that's it's pretty awesome. Also, I love that he brought up my quarterback, Trent Dilfer, baby. Let's go, <laughs> Buccaneers legend. Didn't, didn't Trent Dilfer win a Super Bowl with the with with the uh, with the with, Ravens? Yes, my quarterback Trent Dilfer. Let so go. so Trent Dilfer was drafted by he's a god man. He was drafted by the Buccaneers. Uh, One the of the Buccaneers of all time, basically. Yeah, <laughs> because he came at a he came in at a time when the Buccaneers were still wearing the creamsicles. The team was being speculated to move to Cleveland. It was like a whole disaster. And then, uh, you know, the team gets sold. They stay in Tampa Bay. They get the new stadium. They change their look and all this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's when they kind of realized that they actually had a decent core building, especially on defense. You know, um, they had drafted Warren Sapp and some of these guys. So like they kind of had a team together, but it was pretty clear immediately that Trent Dilfer was not going to be that guy.
<laughs> and so um they uh they went out and got someone else uh <laughs> And uh, and then Trent Dilfer kind of accidentally ends up on a Ravens team that is stacked. And then he just kind of wins a Super Bowl by default because he definitely is not the reason they won that Super Bowl. Yeah, there's a, but he's the God, man. You know, there's there's two types of teams that you know, there's two types of quarterbacks that win the Super Bowl. Yeah, there's the guy that, you know, there's the gunslinger that gets you over the top, that the guy sure. that drives you down the field, two minute warning. And then Tom there's Brady. The guy who, and then there's the guy whose entire job is this. Just just the, the handoff that, that give it. it to the other guy who will actually make the real play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or once in a while, there's Nick, Nick Foles. Foles. There, yeah, there, there's Nick Foles. The, exactly. Who is literally that guy for one year. Yeah. 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 The Joe Flacco effect, if you will. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. And then no, that, gets it, them, that gets them motherfucking paid. And then they don't do anything for the rest of their career. And then they're somehow still above Zach Wilson in the depth chart. So... Bro, it's so crazy to me. Like, the Ravens really, like, yeah, they just win with subpar mid-ass quarterbacks. So, hey, you know, good for them. Well, well every time they've won, it's been because of, spe- you know, like, great skill, like, you know, skill position players. Defense, defense, defense. You know, impact, you know, elite defense. Yeah. You know, you know the best kicker in football. So, sure. they, they, were, they would just outdo you in, in those phases of the game. And they always had a great running game. So, they would just you know, tire the hell out of you on def- you know, you know, when you're on defense, they would, you know, force you on three and out. So their defense was always energized and, you know, they could always settle for field goals if need be, whatever, wherever, you know, like that's like, if, if Nathaniel Hackett had Justin Tucker as his kicker, I would let yeah. him pull up from literally anywhere, anywhere. You know what I mean? Like he could oh, literally, 100%. he could literally go out there at the goal at the opposite goal line. Oh yeah, yeah ninety nine yard. It. It. Yeah, I'd give him a chance. I mean, if there's strong winds, I'd be like, I give him a chance. Yeah, it's if he's in Denver, it's like high yeah. elevation. It's like some wind, high elevation. Wins. Yeah, you could, you could, you know, squeeze it in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, dude, Trent Trent Dilfer is a name that I just he he brings a smile to my face because uh, I'm one of these lunatics, and, and you know this well. Where uh, sometimes when I'm bored, uh, or if it's the off season for a sport, I will go back and watch old games. Uh, on YouTube, like full old games, or I'll watch full old NASCAR races from like various eras. Like, yeah. So anyways, uh, there was a time where I was just watching 90s uh, Buccaneers games, uh, just random ass games. And so, yeah, my boy Trent Trent Dilfer is uh, he's quite that guy. So I, I it, he brings a smile to my face every time I hear about him. And actually, he's now the new, I think, head coach. Google him real quick. I think he just became the coach of UAB. Or oh. at least he got hired to do something. Trent Dilfer. Trent Dilfer. Yeah. 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 I believe he did. Yeah. Uh, he just got signed to do something. Um. Because I just saw it on my feed earlier, and I was like, "My yeah, boy, UAB. Trent. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. UAB. Fuck yeah. Good to hear from. Good to hear that he's still, you know, hanging out in the game and all that kind of good stuff. He, he he's the homie right there. He is still adjacent to a football. That's right. I honestly of of uh, folk heroes that I love. One of my maybe my favorite player in the history of the NFL is a man by the name of Sebastian Janikowski. And Ooh. damn it, I wish that this man was out there doing something because I need sea bass so fucking badly back in football or something. Like I need that man somewhere. Um, I mean, I my entire childhood was watching the Raiders be terrible. But having Sebastian Janikowski and loving him desperately, he was a number one draft, uh, first round drafted uh, kicker, which is it's very Raiders to mm-hmm. just draft a kicker in the first round. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it ended up turning out pretty well. They had him for about a zillion years. It's like they, he, they're, they have like a fit. It's like the fifth pick. They're like, all right, Hall oh, yeah. of Famer linebacker, yep. you know, all pro type running back on the board. What do you guys want? We need the kicker. We need the kicker. Yeah. Yeah. That's just full Raiders. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, he ended up being, you know, I know that there's probably guys that are technically better now with Tucker and all this kind of bullshit, but listen, Sebastian Janikowski will always I mean, for forever. He will always be my favorite kicker of all time. Cause he's just my kind of generation, whatever. 
And um, yeah, so I, I love that man desperately. And then he uh, he went to Seattle and uh, I watched his last ever kick and I knew it was going to be his last ever kick. <laughs> My man oh, was yep, way that. Yep, yeah, yep. he was weighing like 280 or some shit. They trotted his plump ass out there at like their own 40 for like a 60 some yarder. And I was like, he's fucked. Did, didn't it? Didn't he like didn't he essentially like break his leg like wasn't it oh like... dude he blew his knee apart like yeah i'm pretty sure he tore his acl and like fucked up the card like he totally destroyed his knee like yeah and and mm-hmm. the ball would traveled like four yards like it went yeah. nowhere like it was hilarious if you could actually pull it up like i don't know if that's possible like i, I know. you know i feel like that... you know what i'll try to find it and if i can find it i i'll i'll throw it in and then we'll, and then we'll we'll try to watch it because this is honestly my favorite clip i've ever seen like i love him to death but like it's really funny to see this gigantic legend out on the field this fucking sausage in his uniform there is and he no just, chance we he just, can watch ugh. back a guy just snapping his leg well and no he do- you don't even really see anything like he kind of just like falls to the ground and like you just know it's like over you're just like lol and the thing is the game like nobody really gives a shit and they're just like oh because like everyone saw that f- coming like everybody knew it was gonna happen so like he <laughs> falls and then they just kind of like throw it to commercial and they just like barely mention it. They're like, yeah. So anyway, Sebastian went to the locker room <laughs> and uh, that's probably uh, that's probably it for him. They were just like, whatever, who cares? And I'm just like, damn, like what a fucked up unceremonious way for the greatest kicker of my time to uh, to just be out of the league. Like, it's just so fucked. But um yeah, it's weird. Like my favorite ever uh, Raider, um, you know, finished with Seattle, and then my favorite uh, player from Seattle, Marshawn Lynch, ended with the Raiders. So it was kind of a kind of a fun little uh, little thing there. But do yeah, you know, uh, do do you know which game it was that he got injured? Do you know like who they were facing? You know what? It might have even been the Raiders. Um, if I can see Bass Gian Janikowski, um last game let's just google that huh let's just google that his last game oh yeah baby he was going for a 57 yard attempt and it was against the cowboys oh i have it right here then yes oh no please pull it up oh no sea bass why oh no this will this is this is very prevalent to yeah to 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 just oh no oh no just here we go big chungus you got it baby but by the way mind you it's the first half of the game 57 yarder to end that oh yeah oh wait oh yeah so then that shanks is he on the ground this might not be it oh no oh yeah (laughs) Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could just see, uh, so you could just see when he kicks it. It's it's very brief, but like he he stands there for a second. Oh, yeah. That's cool, and then he goes like ah, and then like he does the hobble immediate, yep. and it's and, like yeah. so and far like, right. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, that's uh-huh. right. It was a wild card game. Even I forgot uh-huh. about that. Yeah. My my favorite thing about kickers is like hearing about how like all of like pretty much all of them are either like the coolest dudes ever or the weirdest humans you'll ever meet. Like that's sea bass, baby. Yeah. They're I, like, they're like, like, like I, like the description I've heard is kickers are just the, they're the most unique form of human that exists. Honestly, they're the same exact human archetype of a hockey goalie. Like they're the same people because like hockey goalies are weird motherfuckers. Like they're the same people. Mm -hmm. It's so great. They they specialize at one specific thing and Uh just, they, they just make that thing. Their art. Like like, goofy. Yeah. Like with, like with, like with goalies, they're like, they're like all focused on like their agility and like, like, like angles and like where they can like, you know, like how they different ways they can protect the, you know, their, you know, the goal and everything. And like all these kickers, they're like, you know, there's, there's certain people there that like they can feel the touch of the wind. And it's like, it's going to curve this way. If I touch the ball here, it's going to, if I go here, it's going to do this. If it goes here, it's going to bounce like that. Gonna yeah. It's crazy. Like, like they yeah. know their science for their sport. And then, yeah, they're also just like the weirdest guys. Did you like how I turned it into the Dennis Rodman rebounding thing? I, I, I did. Here, I could do this. Yeah, I could <laughs> do this. Oh yeah. The- do that. <laughs> it's like my favorite part because i'm like what's he even doing right there he's uh, like 
Dude, you've never seen him in a game? Just go. It's just you've never seen. You've never seen that. I don't think so. But it was just like, what the fuck is he? He's just... <laughs> it's almost. It's almost as I. It's almost as iconic as the Kareem Skyhook. Oh, on, is what it? Are you oh, about? oh, my bad. Yeah, I forgot all of his legendary blocks where he does like this weird. Like he's like shooting it. It's like, like he's like a Power Ranger. Or something. It's like, he's, it's like, like he's loading the Terminator it. and his arms like a yeah. like a pump action shotgun. It's so good. Oh, Jesus Christ. Sean, so, you know, speaking of our Detroit sports, <laughs> as we're very clearly not. Yeah, uh, speaking of Terminator, Detroit the, sports. Right. Uh, the Well, they're terminal. I don't know if they're Terminators. Um, but the uh, the Detroit basketball Pistons are, uh, they are firmly in the uh, Victor Wembenyama sweepstakes. Yeah, and they're, they're, I, I, I heard uh, I heard a new term for it today. This one's from Bill Simmons. I like okay. it. Okay. Uh, wobbling for Wemby. That's pretty much what they're doing. I mean, uh-huh. they're they're basically on in cardiac arrest for so him. So they. Yeah. Um, are it, not good. <laughs> Well, it's crazy, man. When you look at the like the the amount of injuries this team's had, mm-hmm. um, they're third in the league in total injuries. You know, as far as players injured this season, uh, it is not even. It, it is December first as of recording, and they uh, they had eleven total players on the injury report this season already. That's just a couple. Uh huh. So. It you could it it quite literally would be quicker for me to read you the players that haven't been injured. Oh yeah, I saw you tweeted that, and that was very entertaining. And then I say, <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, Murphy's Law got injured. Oh no, <laughs> and you didn't even say anything. God damn it! I didn't even realize. God damn it! I was referencing I Murphy's Law, baby. That's a <laughs> that's a deep cut for us. It, it, never mind. Don't worry about oh, it, y'all. Yeah, but, yeah, but... <laughs> Not Murphy's Law. He's on the shelf. But no, it, it it was it was just one of those things where just seeing you know just to the scale how much injury prone they've been combined with the struggles they're having defensively combined. You know, like and the other thing too is you don't realize like you know it's like not just the fact that guys are injured, but it's like guys are coming in and out of the lineup. And you know, like with that, your your uh, you know your 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 fucking rhythms thrown off. This guy's snapping me in the middle of the pod. This pile. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what is wrong? What is wrong with you? Well, you sent me, I, I didn't realize I, I happened to see, I was like, oh, Sean sent me something. So I I opened it thinking like maybe you had messaged me something and it was just you telling me that you had sent a link for the podcast. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit. So then I just sent you back something stupid. Yeah. You just sent me a downward angle photo of you just going. <laughs> Anyways. But so the Pistons, though, yeah, like the the problem is most is primarily injury. Yeah, well, and like the thing is, and is like, youth. well, yeah, also youth. But like the thing is, is if you look at what they've been doing, they actually played really well in their Western Western Co- Conference road trip. They didn't lose a single game by double digits, and they beat Utah and Denver, who were both towards the top of the of the of the rankings in the Western Conference at the time. Still, Still are both Utah thinking- is good. Well, it's it's funny though. They're they're actually sliding quite radically. They're uh they're three and seven or two or eight two and eight in their last ten. They're now eighth or ninth in the West. Yes, yes. It's yes! it's equaling it's equaling out much Water more. Water is finding its level. Thank God, because I don't think it, I it could was always going them in the playoffs. They were so they were like first on offense. Uh-huh. And first on defense to start the season, there was no way that was gonna that was gonna keep up. At this current rate, they're like sixth or seventh on uh, on offense, and I and I, I believe I heard they're 29th uh, in defense over the last stretch, or 29th or 30th in defense. So well, yeah, and and also Mike L-O-L. Conley got injured. Yeah, Mike Conley got injured as well, and he was he was kind of like their you know their steady hand, their veteran presence but listen i think you know the team that's been a really big surprise the indiana pacers are the fourth seed right now in the east and uh tyrese halliburton's been awesome but the nba has been great but anyway back to the pistons it's it's been a nightmare from the sense that they just you know they just can't get guys healthy right Uh, tonight you know as of recording is the first time that they've had everyone healthy but Cade in a while so 
And with Cade, you know, oh, yeah, that's what's just, going on with that still. Yeah. So uh, right now, the latest update with Cade is that they're going through and evaluating the different options for his shin. Um, they're like they're resting him and, you know, keeping him out. But they're, you know, they're getting second opinions and seeing specialists and figuring out what the best treatment plan is just because, you know, with with his shin injury, you know, there's yeah. some, of, some of these types of frac because they're worried he might have a stress fracture. And sometimes the best way to go about it is, is that you can just let it heal. Sometimes you have to, you know, you have to have an operation and let that, you know, let that, you know, th- you know, let that dictate. So it's one of those things where it shouldn't linger in the long term, but it's sure. just, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a tough thing to figure out how to treat it, treat it. You know, it's like if you were to get the surgery, his season would be done. Right. And, and ultimately like regardless i mean the season's completely chalked and honestly for the best because you are in the victor women yama sweepstakes so it's kind of like it's your star player you obviously want to treat it with as much caution as possible and since the season straight up doesn't matter anyways you have all the time in the world to take as much time as you can to be careful with this and and yeah it doesn't matter in the wins and losses column but it still does matter in the and the player development and in and, and, and that sense, because it's like, even though Cade's not out there, like this is great. Uh, this is a great opportunity for Jaden Ivy to have the ball in his hands and to really sure. run the team. Uh, sure. It's a great opportunity for Jalen Duran to go out there and get a ton of run. You know, it's sure. it allows a guy like Killian Hayes, who's been playing really good basketball o- of late, uh, you know, allows him to be in the starting lineup and kind of, you know, be one of the leaders of this team. And even though, it's like it's not always showing in the win column. Like again, like sure. they're really outside of that game against the Knicks, which was you know, which was a rough game. You know, the Pistons really have been competitive. You know, it's you know, it's one of those things where you know, it's it's a combination of this league is insanely deep. I mean, we've just seen the parody. Like the Warriors are still technically not even in the play-in tournament yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, on top of that. Uh, it's, it's the injuries it's, you know, it's the lack of experience and, you know, it's, you know, it just comes down to the fact that, you know, like you said, you know, a lot of this comes down to the fact that I think this team was made to be competitive next year, you know, and like, and, and listen, obviously it doesn't hurt to be, to be, to have the best odds at Victor Wembenyama, right? That certainly doesn't hurt, but again, no matter where they land in that, in that lottery, they'll still get a good player. I'm just, again, I just don't want to get my hopes up, man. For sure. Well, he, in, the, in the, yeah, no. And, and like, honestly, with how much luck we've already had, the fact that we got Cade, the fact that we have some of these great players on the team, it's like, literally, we've been just building through the draft with like great selection after great selection. And I know that there are some idiots out there who don't realize that we've made great selections. Some people think we've done nothing but just waste time and spin our tires and get busts. But I tell you, it's like you said, all jokes aside and saying that they suck and this and that they have been playing very well. They do have a lot of great selections and you just get another great selection next year. And then you see what we can do after that, you know, and also you'll have the cap room to be able to go out and really fill in a lot of the big, big gaps. And uh, yeah, if I may put on, you know, like here, I'll just, you know, I'll give you a little bit of an insight of where I'm at. Sure. You know. I, if, if if I may put my fan hood on for a second to, to give you an explanation of, 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 of where I would, you know, where I would be at, you know, like, you know, yeah, just... here we go. Sean's actual literal holy, fan. Holy, 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 holy. I would, I would, I would, I would, oh my God, Victor Woman Yama with Kate Cunningham and Jada and Jaden Ivy. I need it in my life so bad, but I can't sell myself up for that type of heartbreak, dude. Like, do you understand? Growing up with freaking Greg Monroe and Jonas Jerebko and all these bums, that that you don't you don't you're not accustomed to getting nice things. Jerebko, accustomed to getting nice things. So I'm not gonna set myself up to believe that I'm gonna get nice things because it's happened a little bit of late. How is it gonna continue? It just can't. But overall, Detroit's going to have an opportunity to get a lot of really good players in the draft, no matter where they land. And so, you know, like, it's not something that's imperative of they need to get Victor Wembanyama. So it's one of those. Very true. Like, they could be in a good position no matter what, you know? Very true. We need him. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I think Sean's fanhood is my new favorite segment. <laughs> 
Uh, do I have to wear a hoodie from now on every pod? You don't have to, but I do love the energy. Oh, God. The Darth Sidious-ass energy that you have is just fantastic. That's some good shit there. Do it. Do it. <laughs> it's so good. It's just like, we should really be careful. Do it. <laughs> We should really conservatively think out our options. Fucking do it. I really think we should think about the health and well-being of the franchise. Send that shit. <laughs> <laughs> like 100%, dude. That's the Chicago Bulls front office when they went for Vucevic. That's them literally all of the time. Always. Literally dude, always. They it's are... kind of also the Vegas Golden Knights' mentality. It's just like, we should really think about the long-term ramifications of do it. <laughs> Dude. Like, literally, it's just like, who cares? The Bulls are bad, man. Hey, uh, we don't need to bring that up, Sean. Uh, actually, you know, th there is no team called the Chicago Bulls. It's really kind of a shame that there is no team called that. Uh, I don't know why everyone wears that gear for a team that doesn't exist. I mean, are they like the Flint Tropics? Like, are they like a, like a, oh, they're from Space Jam. That's right. They're from Space Jam. You're right. Okay. Okay. But, oh, all right. Great bit. But the Chicago Bulls are bad, man. Yeah, like it's like, honestly, it's to the point where they might need to consider blowing it up at the deadline and trying to really just go all out. Oh, trying to avoid blowing pick. it up a few years ago. I don't want to blow it up. I won't blow it up. I here's won't here's the thing. Oh, what? Uh, is this or is this not exactly what I said was going to happen when we were talking about it a few years ago, when I was talking about the fact that we should blow it up? And then it was clear that they were not going to blow it up. And I was like, oh, we're doing the Pistons thing where yeah. we're an awful team. And then we're going to go get some guys and like sniff the playoffs and still be an awful team. Yep. And then we blow it up. And so now our rebuild is going to take way longer. Well, and it's well, and, 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 and here's the thing. It's even like it's even like a team like, like never Sacramento. go full Detroit. Well, it's like even even a team like the, the Sacramento Kings, for example, over in the. Mm -hmm over in the Western conference. It's like, all right, they're 11 and nine. They're right in the middle, right in the mix. They're playing really hard. This team is built to get to the playoffs, right? Sure. That's great. Here's a problem with a team that's built to get to the playoffs. Hey, congratulations. You made it to the playoffs. What are you going to do now? And they were like, I, I didn't think I'd get this far. I, I exactly. I it's like, what do you, what do you do when you get here? Like, I, I don't, I don't know. It's like that you have to build your, you always have to build your team with it. Like with, with a championship intention and mindset, like, and like, it's interesting. Cause it's like, even like the Indiana Pacers, it was pretty clear that they were constructing their team to go young and to, uh, you know, go for Victor Wimbanyama. And it's like, yeah, Tyrese Halliburton looks like he's going to be a star. And it looks like, you know, it looks like Benedict Matherin's going to be a stud himself. You know, it looks like these guys can be really good, but like, are they in a way kind of just putting themselves in the middle because like the, I don't think they're ever going to be like good enough to contend for a championship, you know? It's it's interesting. Well, this is why teams like them are uh are in purgatory. Right. Like there's a reason why some teams are just historically stuck in purgatory. Right. Is cuz that's just the way that they always go about it is like right when they're on the precipice of like a big decision that they need to make where it's one path continues you down purgatory and the other path finally breaks the cycle. They always go straight back to purgatory and not always on per like obviously never on purpose, but like mm -hmm. the thing of it is, is like there's no guarantees e e e like either way, but somehow they always accidentally pick the wrong lane, like always. And every now and again, you don't like, you know, Memphis is seemingly starting to pick the right lane and stuff like yeah. that. You know, some of these teams get lucky, but for the most part, there's some of them like the Pacers that are just always stuck there. Well, it's crazy too. the uh, looking in the looking in the Western Conference right now, just like to tell you how close things are. Sure. There is a th there is a uh, three and a half game difference between the first seed and the seventh seed. So. Would you uh, care to fill me in on my other team? You know, I have like twelve teams in the uh, in the NBA. Yeah, now, yeah. Which, you... yeah, which of right, these right, other right. teams? Yeah, yeah. Now, if you could, if you could fill me in on the Miami Heat, um, how bad are we? Because I'm pretty sure that the Miami Heat are dog shit. You know, to, to answer your question, mm. also bad. So the Bulls are nine and twelve. Uh -huh. Miami Heat are ten and twelve. You didn't need to say that. They're, they're... 
they're coupled right next to each other in the standings. It, it's pretty nice. It's actually pretty convenient. I didn't have to move my mouse wheel at all because the Pistons, Bulls, and Heat were in the same part of the standings. I would like to die, Sean. But... <laughs> uh... <laughs> In slightly less related, but sort of also kind of basketball news, would you care, uh, would you like to talk about the recent thing with LeBron James, the uh, interview that he gave after the game? Oh, gosh, that thing, the, the, I don't know why you guys didn't ask me about. So I'm just I, interested to see what your take is. Yeah. So I'm, I personally like want to do like, more research like i'm not sure if that was just like un like, like it, it seems like it was unprompted because he brought it up because no one brought it up right sure. but like so you know for those of you that don't know um there was a, a controversial photo showcasing you know jerry jones you know back when he was in high school age you know clearly protesting against you know black students you know be you know very in this very e civil rights movement he was it was the, in 1957 in Arkansas, and there was black students trying to desegregate and enter the school. And pretty uh, clear that Jerry Jones is quite literally on the wrong side of history. Yeah, he's he's amongst the protesters who were forcibly trying to not allow them into the school. Right, and it's interesting because you know, like, it's definitely like a controversial thing. Sure. I understand that, like, you know, that like you know, LeBron's a Cowboys fan, so in the sense that could be like. <laughs> But, like, here's the thing. Is he a Cowboys fan? Yeah, I think he is. I'm pretty sure he is. Like, He's like a Cowboys and Browns fan for some reason. Anyways. Every, everyone, everyone's a Cowboys fan, if you know what I mean. It's like. But I anyway, mean, I guess I'm not one to talk, but, like, yeah, it is kind of weird. But anyways. Yeah, but, but anyways, you know, like, he, you know, he brought up how, you know, a lot of people were quick, you know, to to ask questions and bring up, you know, he was like a lot of people were quick to ask questions and, you know, bring up the Kyrie situation and they were not quick to, you know, ask him about the Jerry Jones thing. I, I understand that what LeBron's saying in the sense that as, as a whole, mm. as a, as a society, mm. we are not, we are not talking enough about the Jerry Jones photo and we're not having enough of a dialogue about the implications of that. Yes. However, I feel like from a logic standpoint, of course, people are going to be quick to ask you about what your thoughts are in the Kyrie situation because you teamed with Kyrie and there's speculation that you guys want to team again in the future. Whereas sure. the reason why you might not be asked about a Jerry Jones photo so quickly is because you play for the National Basketball Association and not the National Football League. And so I understand sure. LeBron's a big figure and he's going to be asked about all sorts of things. And maybe, you know, like there's certainly like, I, I saw like Stephen A. He's like, I would have asked him about, I'm like, okay. But like, I just, you know, it, it's just, first of all, no, he would not have. Yeah. It's, it's just like, I personally just, I, I think it's a big, I think it's a big old thing. I, you know, I just think what about ism is dumb. Sure. I think it's like, you know, I thought Ky I thought what Kyrie said was was dumb. I think that photo makes G makes Jerry Jones look dumb. I think both yeah. can be true. Sure. And you know, I think b both have to both have to be. You know, there there has to be a conversation had about both. Sure. But like at the same time, I don't know if this was like I don't know if Le like it was this big like LeBron gotcha moment that other people are making it up to be. You know what I'm saying? I so yeah, I've kind of got. A, a similar ish opinion. I think that my opinion is this, that yeah, I think LeBron was trying a little too hard to have like a moment, you know, a little bit. Um, and I feel like it landed a little bit flat in some of his delivery. That being said, I, like you said, what he is saying is completely correct in almost every way in the sense of like, you know, it doesn't get brought up enough. Uh, when rich, powerful, or even just in general, white people do things that are terrible and questionable. Um, but if a black person does something questionable, then suddenly it's national news and it's on the ticker 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part of it that I will give him a slight benefit of the doubt is that 
players in every sport really um but you know especially lebron himself uh are often asked totally bizarre unrelated questions that have nothing to do with basketball all the time uh and you know i don't completely remember but i would be willing to bet that someone asked him about colin kaepernick back in the day well and especially so, because well especially because lebron was the athlete that like the original athlete that started to speak out on a lot of things and he was sure. the one that people were you know he was the one that you know was positioned was told to shut up and dribble right sure. so, so i think he started kind of the more than an athlete type of you know, movement. a hundred percent. But yeah, no, I think in general, like you see in a lot of different sports uh, and whether it's like Aaron Rodgers and stuff like that, which I'm not defending Aaron Rodgers is crazy ass, but like players all the time get asked things that are so unrelated to even their own sport or anything like they get asked political questions. They get questions about other, you know, sports players and things like that. Like, what do you think of this guy? And it's just like, what the fuck do you mean? What do I think of this guy? Uh, My favorite, by the way, is Super Bowl Media Day. Just the amount of different questions that people come up with. It's like, yeah, it's it's like, oh, brutal. It's yeah, it's like one person's like, uh, you know, yeah. Hi there, Mike with Yahoo Sports. You know, like, Uh what is your what is your thought process? You know, on like on like the run game, like how's that going to play a fact? And then someone's like, hi there. When you order mashed potatoes at at dinner, do you order it with butter and gravy or do you order that stuff on the side? You know what I mean? Right. It's like, like, hey, uh, Robert, uh, Pizza Palace. Um, where do you store your bread? You knew that was coming. (laughs) It's the thing that I should have known it was coming. (laughs) but no it it, it, so i will give him the benefit of the doubt there is that it's like if a black athlete in a different sport were to fuck up there's a chance that he would be asked that question honestly of like you know hey lebron you know we know that you're let's say friends with or something like that like colin kaepernick or whatever you're friends with so and so what do you think about them doing this thing you know whatever it's you know stuff like that um but then jerry jones who he's also had you know connections with and stuff like that whatever no question so like he's kind of right in that standpoint a little bit um, well and there like and, and, and there is validity in the fact that like i found out about this jerry jones photo through this from situation. him yeah. exactly and that's the same thing that i was gonna say too is i actually googled it after the fact so i actually do appreciate in some ways like LeBron does some dumb shit like the Twitter meme of him always lying about just about everything is one of the funniest memes of all time because he does say some dumb shit when it comes to social (laughs) issues, though, he's generally pretty in tune. Like he like generally, he, yeah, he does tend to get it right. Uh, other than China, um, which is also kind of a stupid thing I was seeing in the comments, by the way, there was a lot of people like pointing that out while it's fair criticism. I do at the same time think that it doesn't discredit what he's saying because what he is saying is still valid and still correct. Cause yeah, right. I just athletes all the time. You see it constantly where it's like, they'll get asked about Kyrie, 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 Kyrie all day long. You get peppered with this question. Not a single person. Not a single person is bringing up Brett Favre in a single interview, even in the NFL. Not a single one. Now, one reporter is bringing that shit up. Yeah, the only person I heard bring it up was uh, was was Pat McAfee in a joking manner to Aaron Rodgers. And he was like, Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. And and, yeah. And then Aaron Rodgers like scoffed at it like, man, I can't believe you'd bring that up. What the fuck do you mean? This dude robbed an entire community for like decades. Like he was stealing millions of dollars. He's a piece of shit. What the fuck are you talking about, Aaron? So, yeah, yeah, it's bizarre. Like, oh, my bad. Sorry. It's like societally unacceptable to bring up Brett Favre because it's like, oh, come on. That's low. That's not classy. We're going to find a way to work it into every episode, man. Every every pizza palace that some bitch is going to bring up Brett Favre. Absolutely, dude. It's become my mission because it is bullshit where I'm just like, I, I honestly agree a lot with what LeBron's saying here. If I just don't understand why. I mean, I know why, but like, it's just fucked that a guy like that brett Favre, it's like considered you know like not classy or like a low blow or kind of fucked up to talk about it but you can talk about and shit on you know Kyrie and all these guys like all you want all day long they're they're just fair game and it's like well is Kyrie saying some dumb ignorant shit yep but like brett Favre is robbing people well it's like (laughs) like what are we what are we doing well, and it's like, again, that's where, like, to me, that's where, like, the I think that's where, like, the what about is I'm going to, like, fall down like a trap because I feel like sometimes people, like, just go from, like, 
you know, use that as like the, well, cause like, you know, it's like, cause to your point, it's like, yeah, the Brett Favre thing is obviously like, that's where like our, like we need to be having like prevalent conversations about that stuff. But like people oh, often will, will, will take like, you know, like it's like the, Hey, what Kyrie said was fucked up. And they're like, well, what about what Brett Favre did? That's way more fucked up than what that's I, true. It's like, yeah, but like, it's like you, you, normalizing anti Semitism does not, you know, is still not good. And just yeah. because Brett Favre did something shitty does not mean that we should give Kyrie a pass on it. And even then, 100%. I think, and even then, I think a lot of us are at the point where I think we all agree that Kyrie wasn't outright trying to be an anti Semite. I think he was just ignorantly sharing anti Semitic, a, 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 a product that held a lot of anti Semitic beliefs and theories and and ideologies and he yeah. and he doubled down when he was given the opportunity to say that he was he didn't know what he was talking about talking about i so. personally i think that Kyrie is fairly deep into black israelite like yep. thought and movements and stuff like that and whatever and a lot of that tends to be very anti-semitic throughout some of their their stuff so I think he's more black Israelite than he is anti-Semite yeah. in a yeah, lot of we don't ways. Got, yeah, we don't got to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of where he leans. He's not quite uh, Kanye saying that he likes that's, Hitler. That's a, that's a palace we're not going to bring our pizza into. You know what I mean? It's like one of those sure. things where, where we're just going to. No, no, I get it. I know, I, I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. But, but no, I mean, it, well, and it is important in some ways because it's like, I mean, he literally had an entire like giant rally of the black israelite movement outside of his stadium you know like supporting him before the game um yeah. so i it, it is relevant to kind of what we're talking about a little bit and i think also like it is really there was scary weird thing with jalen brown where he was like where he was like yeah awesome to see all these people out here supporting and they were and they were like wait what and he was like no i was just saying that it was cool to see people organizing like say that they're glad Kyrie's back and it's like brother you know that that's not what they were doing like <laughs> let's not be stupid they didn't they didn't look like they were all like <laughs> like having their fist up as they were hitting the over on Kyrie's assist that wasn't what they sure. were doing sure so yeah man <laughs> yeah that that was kind of strange but no yeah, it, I, I I think Kyrie though it is important to bring up uh, and again, to kind of defend um, some people like LeBron James, who have not come to Kyrie's defense, but at the same time kind of helped to not crucify him, because I think a lot of people have been, you know, putting him in the same boat as Kanye West. Now, they're both saying ignorant shit, but here's the thing. Kanye was literally on Alex Jones talking about how he liked Hitler and stuff like that and thought he had good ideas and shit. Yeah, Whereas Kyrie different. Irving is different. not saying these things. He has not it's, said any of these explicitly. Kyrie things. shared a documentary. Yeah. Kanye's at the level where he'd be making the documentary. Right. Exactly. So I think, you know, to give Kyrie the benefit of the doubt and like until he proves us otherwise. Yeah, it is fair to say that, like, you know, I, I think the media was very quick because it was a juicy story that after everything with Kanye, it was very easy and very quick to be able to say, oh, look, another guy is saying the same thing and like lap him in with it. Right. Um. So I, I think that that got conflated a little bit. Um. So, my yeah, thing but Ky my thing with Kyrie is always just going to come down to the fact that he just I think he could have he could have immediately you know, deflated this entire situation by just saying, you yeah. know, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't intend to hurt any people. I apologize if that, you know, if that was, you know, that that's not who I am. Like he, if he just said that at the beginning, literally none of this would have happened. So it's like, I understand that like people are like, oh, well, we're quick to question like about the Kyrie thing. Well, it's like, well, part of that was because Kyrie just wouldn't apologize at the beginning and just admit his wrong like literally it's like i understand well, whenever you're like, asked the question like if you're asked point blank the question are you anti-semitic and then you go well like that's not a good answer and the mm -hmm. same thing is if you ask you know a or, white person like oh are you racist and then it's like well it's well, well it's like, generally a it's generally a red flag when one the answer isn't just a flat out yes or no but yep. also when you have to ask for clarification by what their answer means and what they mean by saying it. Like exactly. When, when, when that's your answer, that's when it's like, um, 
Like that's yeah. Like, like don't play Mister Fucking Secret Agent. Like we're asking yeah. you a question because it's just like I, if I was ever asked that question, like I wouldn't want to sit there and pussyfoot around it because it's just like by doing that, I wouldn't even look... let them finish the phrase if they're like, "Are you an anti?" No, no, Whoa. exactly. It's like such a bizarre thing to like kind of let fester it's like why do you want people to think that you that, suck like what the fuck's well, wrong with you I'm dude saying. like he, he just he thinks he's smarter than everybody yeah. he's trying to he's trying to outthink everything he's trying to maneuver things in, in, you know the proper way and it's just like dude just just like just just humble yourself just yeah like down. brett Favre needs Be to humble. humble himself and uh tell people that um yes he did steal all that money and he, he doesn't need to, to humble jail. himself he needs to turn himself in that's a whole different thing he needs agreed to, he yeah needs my to... man tried to be like i didn't know where that stuff came from i just thought it was monies i'm he like needs, he needs to, he needs to be in guantanamo bay <laughs> speaking of guantanamo bay uh down in florida our man antonio brown has been arrested because there's another gentleman who just cannot seem to do anything right ever speaking of people that can't do anything right the tampa bay buccaneers lost to the cleveland <laughs> browns in overtime <laughs> i i've never been so sad <laughs> like that's not even true. Like I'm, I, so I watched the tail end of that game because they switched to it after whatever game was on, and um, it, it was just like one of those games where like I just felt it. Like I knew we were gonna lose. I was just like, oh, we're going into over. Uh, that's an L. That's just straight up an L. And it's just, yeah, man. Whatever clutch gene the Buccaneers had two years ago, it is so hilariously gone. Their coaching staff is inept, and they need to be fired. Well. When you, you know, it's one of those things where I, I, I can understand a coach wanting to be careful and being sure. conservative and all those sure. types of things to a certain extent. But when you say, I didn't want to throw an interception when your quarterback is Tom, is Tom Brady, it's like, if you can't trust that guy, to make the throw to Ooh. Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, some of the best wide receivers in the game, then I don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Hmm. Who should we trust? Tom Brady, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, literally one of the, the greatest quarterback of all time with yep. some of the best weapons he's had throughout his entire career or yep. the worst running game Tampa's had in their entire existence of this roster. And perhaps. Yep in the in a long time yep. let's go with the running game it's bizarre and they've done this all season and this is what i've been harping on this is why i've been defending tom brady so much is just because i'm like listen it's not him when you look at his stats and when you look at the way that he's been well. playing he is still playing excellent football he's playing at an elite level well. at this point tom. i Listen, listen, he's not, though. He's still playing at an no. absolutely elite level. No, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah. My thing is, is we can't sit here and pretend that he totally didn't, you know, ask for this as far as getting Bruce Arians out of being the head coach. We totally yes. know that he wanted him fired. We yes. totally know that, you know, that he wanted a change in that seat. We we know he probably didn't want to come back to Tampa in the first place. Right. Sure. So like, and it's, it's weird that we're talking about, you know, like next season, it's weird that we're already talking in December, or November about potential where he could sign next. And sure. it's a brother. He's going to be 46. He has his $360 million broadcast contract. This I don't season. think he's ever going to do that, by the way. The I've actually, yeah, I think I've actually completely flipped to the mind that I think that that offer is cute and it's out there. He's not signed anything. I don't actually think he's ever going to accept that deal. I thought he signed it. I don't think he did. Like, I don't need. I'm, sure I'm pretty sure they agreed to a deal. I'm pretty you sure. Could, yeah, look into it, please. Like, Google that contract because I'm pretty sure that he didn't. And in, in regardless, I don't think he's ever going to do that deal. Like, I don't think he's actually going to go into broadcasting. Um, I think he's probably going to sign a two year at least deal with a different team. Uh, and I think he's going to circle back to still trying to find a way to get ownership of another team, possibly the Dolphins still. Um, I, I think that that's likely what's going to happen. I could see him going to the 49ers. Um, I don't know. It, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I see happening uh, with him. I have heard a lot about the fact that we might pick up Jacoby Brissett after the season, um, which could be good. Um, 
Yeah, no, Tom definitely holds the blame of getting rid of Bruce Arians for sure. I think that that's obviously not great. Uh, I, I also don't think he expected Ryan Jansen to be not there. Um, I think that that's obviously huge. Go ahead. So th- like they have a contract in place, a 10 year, $375 million deal, but also they literally have his co-host picked like, like they, they're like hmm. his, is is like his, like his broadcast partner. So it's like, it's not like, it's just like, Oh, this is like a fun idea. It's like, we like we know who you're doing this with. We know the terms like we have it all like, you know. Yeah, I just I didn't I wasn't sure if he had actually put ink to paper or anything, because my thing is that I'm like, it's not like he signed a I'm going to do this in 2023 because like he's still playing football. So it's kind of considered like a standing offer. Yeah. And let's be honest. So like my thing is, I wonder if it's one of those like it's here for you when you're ready. But like, if you don't want to do it, like there's probably a pretty easy. Oh, yeah. I I genuinely don't think he's going to do it. Well, I mean, when you have that much when you're when you're Tom Brady and you have that much power and you're that, you know, like you're that rich, you can get out of a contract literally whenever you want. Like, I, I think he's going to be significantly more interested in ownership. I, I mean, I, I definitely think that could be, I definitely think that could be down the line, but I think I still think he has to grow in business before doing that. And I think, sure. I, I think I could see him not doing the entirety of the 10 year deal. Sure. And just doing like five years of the con. Like, I think he's going to, because to me, I see him going mogul, mogul mode, like going full shack and just becoming this like mogul businessman, like, you know, just building, building an empire, like, so that, sure. so that he can get to a position to, to buy a team. Because, you know, even though like Tom Brady's still going to have like a, like, you know, a good amount of wealth, you know, he, he's going to have to get more equity. He's going to have to like, you know, he's going to have to get investors to help. Like, but even then, like, especially after the FTX thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like as as if this season couldn't get worse for Tom. It's like, hey, my man got divorced. My man got scammed. My man's got, got a stu- terrible football team. Like my man's got everything going on. And yeah, like, no, it's brutal, man. It's really it's just, brutal. And it's just so funny to me because it's like I hate crypto and I hate Tom Brady. And to see that just that perfect marriage yeah. of clusterfuckery. It yeah. just makes me so happy. It sucks sure. to see Steph Curry get caught in the in the stray, but at the same time, it's uh it's a good lesson to show you out there. If you generally think you're smarter than everybody else and you wonder why everyone isn't investing in this, there's generally a reason. Because crypto sucks. It's stupid. They fucked <laughs> around and they indeed found out. Um yeah, yeah the- to all those to all those people who who bought graphics cards to mine Bitcoin. How's that looking for you? I got to be honest. Investment? I, I, the first inkling that I, I mean, not the first, like I've always kind of thought that crypto was a little bit like, not sure about this. Mm-hmm. When I knew it was like definitely fucked though, was actually when, um, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. took his contract with the Rams in crypto. I was like, oh, it's fucked. Like, that's when I knew, like, I just, I, for whatever reason that like just did it for me. I was like, oh, it's fucked because See? I just. It's when you're taking contracts in crypto, I'm like, this is one of those dumbass things where you think it's going to be a thing. So you get in and think you're on the ground floor of something and really you're just left holding the bag. Yeah. You see, I could I could understand I could understand Bitcoin to a certain extent. Sure. Right. Sure. I, I I can understand, you know, like if if you truly have have like, you know, been, you know, been following cryptocurrency and bitcoin and you invest in it knowing the risks and sure. and, and you go in with that type of mindset sure. that's one thing to me I, I i immediately was like well like still like what what's to say it couldn't just crash one day well uh and then like, you know to me when i knew it, when i knew it was all it was like all right this will this will this will this will go into the crap shoot within a year uh-huh was when we just started seeing the the metaverses and blockchains and and in the in the in the rising of nft yeah know, nfts was or, like oh no hey, i think nfts killed, killed crypto to be honest with you yeah when i saw eminem spending like two billion or some bullshit on a fucking gorilla profile picture i was like it's over like, oh it's yeah just, it's it's so so fucked dude it, it's crazy to me and honestly like i think 
So one of the things that I always think about with money, I'm just fucking black pilled and just a total cynical like i don't believe in the good in anything at this point so like my thing is, is that whenever i see shit like this i think about okay what is the promise oh that that people are going to get rich okay who generally gets rich wealthy white people okay so like when i see a bunch of normal random ass people like in my local neighborhood at applebee's being served up ftx ads so that they can buy crypto and nfts and all this dumb shit and like when i see a lot of you know athletes and stuff like that many of them you know minorities that maybe don't have a lot of like education when it comes to certain things with like this space or whatever it just feels like it was set up by a bunch of rich white guys to scam us and what do you know sean it is like well, it's literally like, a scam like set up to completely fuck over people who either don't know any better or who are being given bad advice well you so know we're who, left holding the bag well, well you know you, you know what i'm starting to think i'm starting to think that the the pyramid schemes i think people have gotten smart to that stuff you know yep. what i mean Yep. I think people have evolved from pyramid schemes to cryptocurrency and, and the blockchain and NFTs and stuff like that. I agree. Like, it's that exact same energy. It's also the exact same type of people who happen to get into cryptocurrency because it's always like that guy that you're like, you know, because I, I I had that buddy that, you know, that, you know, that buddy that from high school that to, like uh -huh. I remember the first buddy that totally, you know, was in a pyramid scheme. Oh, he was like, no. He was like, hey, man, let's let's get together and let's hang out. Let's catch up. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. We meet in a McDonald's parking lot. He's like, dude, I've been working. Dude, I got this awesome business opportunity, man. I want to tell you about it. And it's like, oh, man, you can you can do all this by selling energy drinks. And if you get to Diamond Plus, they'll buy you a car. And it's like, you know, it's like you just sit there and you listen to him. And it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's like you draw and it's like, OK, so you have this person. And it goes this person, this person, then this person, this person, this person. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's that scene from, yeah, it's it's when Jim just draws the pyramid. <laughs> it's, I pretty much, I literally got out a piece of paper and I literally did that with him <laughs> while we were sitting in the car. I quite literally did that. I was like, did he learn? Uh, Yeah, he later was like, yeah, that was some bullshit. I was like, ah. Uh -huh. Uh, -huh. uh -huh. no but I, it, it, that's honestly the thing that i just think about because i just think about like would the rich and powerful want us to get wealthy i don't really fucking think so like uh -huh. I, I i hate to be the bearer of bad news but i don't think random uh, college and high school dropouts who just go to the dispensary every day and a bunch of fucking athletes that they already take advantage of I don't think those are the guys that they're really like out there trying to help become billionaires. Like that's literally not how the fuck that ever happens. Dude, my favorite thing, even the Pistons commentators were were joking about <laughs> cryptocurrency. Cuz so they were on the they were on the Western Coast trip and they were uh -huh. at they were at crypto.com arena. Yes, the Johnny, crypt baby. Yeah, so Johnny Kane he brought up how uh, last year, Detroit signed a deal, uh, or uh, last year, uh, uh, LA signed a deal to uh, a 20 year agreement to make this crypto.com arena. 20 year? Oh, no. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Greg Kelsey's like, I don't think it's going to last that long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Miami Heat already, because they were FTX Arena. They were FTX Arena. Mm -hmm. Which is so, oh man, that makes me so sad. I'm like, man, y'all really fucked up. Honestly, well, this they, is like yeah, the well, whole they problem. Out, they right away were like, yeah, we're out. We're out. Well, that, this is the whole thing is that I'm like, this is why it should be Miami Arena or Detroit Arena. Shit like that. You know, Pistons Arena. Like, just name it after your team, because then you're just going to run into this dumb shit every fucking but, time. But, like, you, you, you well, run this risk. I mean, look at SoFi Stadium. SoFi yeah. to me looks like a fucking scam. But in fairness, though, like one of the biggest sources of like like the the arena sponsorship is one of the bigger spot, one of the bigger forms of revenue for these teams. Like it is like a way, you know, for them to, you know, have that type of branding, have that type of partnership. They do help and provide a lot of different things like the like the sure. uh, like uh, even like the Bengals, they specifically got a a naming sponsorship so that they could prepare for Joe Burrow's contract in the future, but also so that they could build an indoor practice facility because they were the last team in the league to not have an indoor practice facility. 
Uh, Which is insane when you are in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, imagine, yeah, it's like Joe Burrow, he probably showed up day one, and he's like, yeah, so I'm not dealing with this shit, and they're uh-huh. like, we're on it, we'll get a sponsor, we'll sell this to Pornhub if we have to, Joe, we're <laughs> on it. <laughs> We'll, we'll have a we'll have a brazzer we'll we'll make a uh, brazzers arena if we have to Joe. <laughs> Fucking bangbros.com arena. <laughs> oh Jesus fucking Christ. No, but like it, it is true. Like he's probably sitting there, he's like, you know, the LA Rams look pretty good, and they're like, we're on it. <laughs> yeah, it's oh. yeah, it's, it, but you know, it's it's wow. one of those things where you know, like, yeah, it, it, it's unfortunate, but like, yeah. I, I think it's more so about companies being smarter about like our teams being smarter and vetting about who they're working with. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, For I sure. think, I think a lot of people, like, I think crypto is just such an, it was like such a new space it's in because it, it, when you, when you think of, you know, like athletes and the type of businesses they get into, it literally hit every, like the, like it, it hit the bingo card of buzzwords for what, for what athletes get into. It was in tech. It's a get rich quick thing. And it's, you know, it's this new, you know, this new un, you know, undiscovered venture. You know, yeah. they always, they always want to be, you know, uh, you know, uh, pioneers and want to plant, you know, plant their ground in fields that other, you know, other people aren't doing. They always want to be the greatest of the, what they're doing. Right. right so right. they're like, well, here's this field, you know, because technology so new, here's this, you know, it, you you know about the stock market, but here's this whole ty- whole different economy. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's just- only gonna go up by like five hundred percent. So like, yeah, I could give you a million dollars, but what if I give you a million dollars in Bitcoin? And like, no, it honestly, the thing that's the most disappointing for me and so frustrating is that like they do it to the most vulnerable people uh, possible. Like you have these athletes who don't know any better, who are coming out of college from all different walks of life, and um, 90% of them don't come from fucking money. So it's like you have some guy approach you who seemingly knows something about money and he goes, Hey, invested into the, my crypto thing. You're going to go, okay, I'll take my salary in crypto. Everyone else seems to be doing it. It seems to be going well for those guys. So I'll do it. And even Odell's doing it like shit, if he's going to do it, then I'm going to do it, you know? And so then next thing you know, it's just like, everyone's fucked. Um, and even Cade Cunningham, like uh, luckily it wasn't his actual bonus from what I started to read a little bit. Um, but he did receive a bonus, uh, through some crypto bullshit or whatever. And it's, it's gone. He, yeah, it's he, just, made it's a, gone. He, he made, he made an agreement. Um, he, he made an agreement, you know, with, uh, with a, with a crypto, market Mm -hmm. with a cryptocurrency market and he he elected to receive the majority of that payment in cryptocurrency so you know luckily it's kind of one of those things where you know you kind of get to end the deal early but also it's not really like you know it's it's not like you're out too much i mean it's not the end of the world yeah and he's also not technically out anything because it's not like it was his team bonus or like right and it's also like i think also fortunately for Cade, it's one of those things where it's just like oh well I i didn't get the money for that that's a bummer Whereas, you know, for guys like Steph and Tom, like they're getting sued for, right. for and their it, involvement. And and like they have, and I they don't have, blame them at all, to be honest with you. I know you you hate Tom and stuff like that, but I don't think that those No, guys, in all seriousness, yeah. no, in all seriousness, I don't blame them at all either. I think they got duped. I think a lot of yes. athletes are getting into the business world. I think crypto is, you know, such an opportunity. You know, people are, you know, it was it it, it was popular. It was, mm-hmm. you know, it is something that, you know, there's still people that are you know, in the space and, and tons look- of people have made money from it. I, I want to know those people, but well, yeah. no, no, no. Like obviously not currently, but I'm saying like there and, and maybe even currently, cause like the thing is, is that the people who did truly invest like many years ago, like, you know, however much that they put in, you know, crypto was like $20 or whatever. And now it's even still at its crash is like worth 20,000 per coin or whatever. So like those people are still doing all right. And like, I knew a guy like when Elon was doing that bullshit where he was pumping the Dogecoin, I knew a guy who as a joke in like high school or some bullshit, like bought some Dogecoin and just like, LOL. And then he forgot about it. And then all of a sudden this bullshit happened and he logged back in and he had 15 grand. So like, right. I actually literally knew a guy who got 15 grand. Right? So like those stories right. are cool. The problem with those stories is much like any other pyramid scheme or this or that or whatever. You hear one success story and you think you could be next. Well, well, here's the other thing. 
how how often does that turn into like similar to like a gambling story where you hear where your buddy went to the roulette t- table, rolled some die, won fifteen thousand dollars because it's that similar type of high, and they go and do the exact same thing because they think it's going to get that same result, and then they're exactly. Broke. I, mean, I mean, literally. <laughs> Uh, a YouTuber that I used to watch, I think you used to watch Boogie Two Nine Eight. Yes, yes, he yes. He made a video at the beginning of at the beginning of 2022 that said, "I'm finally rich. How I made, how I got rich off cryptocurrency." And then at the end of 2022, made a video saying, "I need your help," and explained how he got broke, ex- uh, how he got broke investing all of his money into cryptocurrency and so you know and and like the the troubling thing is that it's like it's not just one marketplace where people have you know where people just haven't been able to access their money sure like like so it's just one of those things where if you're gonna do it just just know what you're doing please like it's it's just with any investment you should be prepared to lose it and the other part of it is too is that it's like you know, people talk about like, oh, well, if you just study the blockchain, it makes a lot of sense, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. But like, the thing is, is that the difference with like an actual stock is that you're buying a company that actually has like actual fiscal results over the course of however many years that they've been in business. They actually have employees. They actually have like a lot of tangible things that you can look into to wonder how is this business performing? How will they continue to perform? What other dividends? Shit like that. A coin is just a fucking made you know up else? thing with nothing. You know what it else? You know nothing. what else it has? You know what else it has, Robert? What's that? Regulations. Well, exactly. It has, like, like there's like the stock market has laws and regulations and, and loosely it, followed by our uh, our house of representatives listen but it's the point that that it's the, at least something's no there, i know i'm, I'm right joke, but crypto's yeah. the wild west yeah it's like you know and, and and that and i think that's you know to me that's the thing of when we're talking about how you know like we're, we're trying to understand because at, at, listen at the end of the day i still think like i i know that like what nfts were as like a like like investing in an image and like do it like i think that's dead i could still see like a form of an nft like you know like digital tickets or like you know like or like i've I've heard like concepts and ideas that have been like interesting to me right but like i I think at the end of the day like the the thing is is like unless it actually brings value to the consumer unless there's actually something reliable to say that you're actually owning something of legitimate value like that that's the, that's the real thing is like you know just people as a like, wealth building asset i think that that's nonsense but i think yeah. as a technology that can be used that's that's what i'm saying yeah yeah as like a day-to-day possible use for various things that maybe one business perfects that and that business is an investment that you could make on the stock exchange or something like that. But like investing in a singular NFT for that singular NFT to make you money, I I think is mostly a pipe dream. Yeah. Right. Right. But, for sure. But also, but at least that. the NFTs are not the super Mario movie. That looks like ass. Uh, <laughs> but Sean, Dude, can I just say, by the way, what, if we're on the movie, if, and, and maybe we could add the podcast on this. Sure. So James, I mean, everyone can't... stopped listening anyways. <laughs> Everyone, as soon as we hit crypto, they're like, "What the fuck is this?" And they as clicked soon as off we of hit this bullshit. crypto in the stock market. They were done. What, they were yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. Or they're angrily typing in the comments. Yeah, exactly. But uh, so, J- I'm not sure if you saw this, but James Cameron. Mm. Um. So he was asked about you know because people are are worried because I'm not sure mm. if you know, but Avatar: The Way of Water, mm. which is an actual movie title that I have to say has a runtime of three hours and 10 minutes. Right. And so it, it, people asked him, when can they go take a bathroom break? Like, when would be a good time to take a bathroom break? And he's and James Cameron said, they can take a bathroom break any time they want. Because and he the said, boring. and he said, and I quote, they can see the scene they missed when they come see it again it's just so douchey and it's It's not just the fact that like in the midst of a recession he's telling these people to come watch it again but it's the fact that that the first movie came out in 2008 it's been 14 years and not only are we getting this sequel but we're getting like five more of these movies or whatever the hell 
the amount they've committed to. He's at least planned eight. I know that for sure. And he's been saying that since the first one. And what's insane about it is that I'm like, like you said, 14 years, like think of the amount of people who were not alive when the first one came out, who are now in almost high school, who are now going to suddenly see this second one and be like, the fuck is this? Well, even then imagine like, imagine being the person that like did see avatar and someone's like, Oh, well like what's that? I They're did. like, Oh yeah. So like there were these blue people and they, they had sex with their hair and then a yeah, bunch of like, and then, people like, came and shot their tree and they were mad about it. Like, well, like that's my thing. <laughs> I like when I saw that movie, <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was a, a great world that he built. I thought it was incredibly mm. impressive visually. I get all that. I Overrated agree. as hell. Anyway. Yes. I saw it I, my freshman year, and I was, like, blown away the first time I saw it, but that's because I was a dumbass kid, and it was also visually impressive for yeah. like, circa 2008. From a whenever. technical aspect, that movie is is a is is a marvel. Yeah. However, it forgets the whole part where, where a movie has to be entertaining, and that that's yeah. the other thing. Also... It's the fact that it's like it's like I, I would get if they committed to one more movie and it's mm. like the, and, and I would and I would understand that they were just like about 12 years ago, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would get if they were just like, let's just do this one at a time and see how this goes. Sure. Eight. Yeah. James Cameron's kind of like out of his fucking mind. Like he's been obsessed with this vision. Now, the thing of it is, is like people have asked him fairly. Uh, are you going to wait 14 years in between movies? Well, apparently between then and now he's been spending all of his time, like making it so that when this one comes out, the other seven or whatever the fuck, like come quickly, like <laughs> in succession afterwards. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the other thing was for all these years. It was like, this yeah. was announced in like 2015. Yeah. So, so it was like for six or seven years, it was like, we're delaying it, but don't worry. It's going to be magnificent. And they're like, we're delaying it again. We're delaying it again. And it's like, all right, is this movie actually coming out? Because by the time they delayed it the fourth time, I already didn't care by the, by the second. I didn't care by the first, to be honest. And then it's like, yeah, man, I just, I, you know what the really sad and fucked up part is though? I want it to flop so badly, but what's that? Exactly. But. I have a feeling that it's going to be a box office major success. I really do. I really think it's going to do extremely well. And I think that he's going to be like, see, I told you. And I think the reviews will actually probably be pretty good. And I, I think that he'll relatively have a hit on his hands. Listen, I think that's this the fun part. Do, listen, I think this one will do well. But I think eventually, I think people will see it. I think box office wise will be a hit. I think, I think the reception will be. And I think by the by the time the next one comes around, I don't think people will give a shit. Yeah, I think it'll be similar uh, to some of the other movies like um, Fast and the Furious where they've been going on for a while to where like there will be the loyal fan base that like can't wait. But like at, the rest of the people are going to be like, ah, fuck it, right. Man, what but, are we doing? But like Avatar is never going to get to like it's never going to be near like Star Wars or like Lord of the Rings or no, like, no, 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 it's no, no. not like, I, I, I just don't understand why this movie is, is being put in this pedestal. You when don't was... understand. It is a furry, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, dude, it was more of a marketing campaign than it was a movie. Well, well, true, but it, it's actually now a furry fetish movie, uh, you know, because they like do the whole hair tentacle thing. And I, so a I... lot of furries are going to watch this and uh and this is their jam man i mean like this is their super bowl like so I say, it's just... by the way that just made me so uncomfortable as a kid <laughs> when when i just first saw that when there was just like it the... was like what the hell's going on it's just like it you're like, like oh like... bond with my hair but then they also do it to the creatures they ride like they'll plug in like their hair to like the like the dog or the, the yeah like, horses it's or, both like, the... a way to establish a connection as like <laughs> as you as like a as like as like a leader in its pet but then also establish a, a love connection like it's so weird it's like what are we doing dude it, listen it's the blue people's uh cloaca you know it's their listen, one hole all, all i remember <laughs> was that all i remember was the guy came came to the planet in a wheelchair and then he didn't have to be in a wheelchair when he was the blue guy and then Jane Lynch was in the movie for some reason, and she had she was she had a part, and I think, and then 
And then speaking of blue cloacas, I think it's time for us to leave. <laughs> Oh Jesus Christ! The, the the final twenty to thirty minutes of this pod went off went off the rails <laughs> in a way that this never has before. I and I'm, and I am further full, from. We talked about cryptocurrency and Avatar for the last twenty minutes of this pod. The further from God that the Pizza Palace strays, <laughs> the closer to my heart it gets. Listen, we're we're the pot of the people, all right. You know, listen, they they know the pistons people, are fucked. They people? know the lions are fucked. <laughs> they don't we're need us to people. tell them that. Yeah, we're a pot of the people. Which people again? I don't know. Ain't nobody fucking here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, uh, I love this. I I love this weird ass pod. Yeah, me too. <laughs> if you somehow made it to this point, please put avatars in the chat, please. <laughs> Yeah, tell us what. Tell us which. Well, which character from the first Avatar movie was your favorite? First of all, name a fucking character, and if you can somehow do that, also name your favorite scene because I guarantee you, not only can you not remember a scene, but also there's no shot you remember a name of a single character. Dude, it's it's like literally the more I think back to it, it's like oh my gosh, that movie was literally Pocahontas. It's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's like a really like, badly done. Yeah, it's a really, really badly done Pocahontas. Because at least Pocahontas had like good songs. Yeah, but this had like they I had mean, some bops. It, yeah, it did have good visual effects. They did have similar levels of genocide though, so I get it. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> <laughs> On that note.